So you ended up in New York. He started tasting a bit of freedom. Mm. Your wife's pregnant. Yeah. You should be thinking to yourself, well, do you know what? I'm going to live the good life. But you end up involved in one of the biggest heists in American history. Yeah. $8 million. Like, yeah. What was going through your mind? Like, even though did you still have that in you, uh, you needed to survive, make some money and, well, and still have that buzz about it? Before the big robbery, I had one of the greatest jobs I'd ever imagined. I was working in a casino and I was getting so much money. Every day you're getting paid, you're getting a tip every day. I had so much money I couldn't deal with it, you know? I'm talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. You're seeing all these actors, famous boxers coming to their casino. Was, I, was in the, I didn't like to go home in case I missed something. I just loved working. I worked seven days a week. I was a workaholic, you know? But I met this friend of mine who helped get me into America. He was an American cop. Now, here's a contradiction. Here's an ARA man, and his best friend's a cop, you know? See, I've been hopping over here. You know, we shoot the cops over here, but you got to think differently because this is an American cop, Irish American cop, and all they're thinking about is hot dogs, watching a baseball game, and they're about, oh, I'm going to kill a Catholic, I'm going to kill a Protestant, you know? So people are always think, fuck, Sam, you fall people, you got a best mate who's a cop. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, it's a strange thing. But this guy himself was a legend. He highly decorated for bravery, numerous occasions, stopped armed robbers and all that sort of stuff, but he was also Malcolm X's bodyguard. When, the, when he came to New York, he was one of the cops assigned Malcolm X's bodyguard, you know, because he was so highly respected, you know, among the black people up in Harlem and all. So he was a guy, he worked in this place, it was a beer place, as a, you know, just making beer, but he also had a second job, and that was Brinks. And the Brinks was it's like a big fortress where all these armored cars come from the whole of America. And they deposit all the money from the banks, and they sits in this big fortress. It's like Fort Knox when it's called Brinks. You know, it's very, very famous in America. And he worked there as a security guard there on extra money. And a few times I was up during the 4th of July, we'd be sitting eating hamburgers during the 4th of July, just celebrating America and kicking the Brits out of America. And the next thing you look at all these safes, the says this room filled with money, not even locked. And all of a sudden, my man's going, this is crazy, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely, and I used to say, why, is, why isn't that closed? I said, what's the point of closing? We're going to take it out soon and get it burnt or move it on to another part of America. So it's, they're that lazy, they got that lazy and complacent. They didn't even like the safes and all the money's just coming out, spilling out, you know? And then I go back to New York and thinking I'm talking to someone, but I'm not, I'm thinking about all these safes for all this money and this fort. And I still couldn't get it out of my head. And then after a while, I finally says, you know something? It's, it's just aggravated me. It's like a cheeky thing. They're like saying, come on, dare you. And I did it. You know, I said, I'm going to rob the Brinks, get as much money as I can. I'm talking about, I wanted a couple of hundred thousand. Because I said, if I can get a couple of hundred thousand, that's enough for me. You know, I live a life, of, you know, little did I know what was coming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you think that was a test from God to see if you were changed? Oh, man? No, I shouldn't have done it, you know. Maybe it was a test of God because I regret doing it. I would have fucking done it as well, uh, mate. No, honest. yeah, I, I did it and I loved doing it. It was more like well, back to the old days, yeah. you know what I mean? It was just the whole adrenaline, <laughs> the, the cheekiness of it, you know what I mean? But afterwards I regret it. I'm not saying it because, oh, yeah, I seen religion. I should never have done it because America was good to me. The first country I ever tasted freedom, I got a good job. I looked after my wife, my kids, you know? It was a great country and I love America. I love America. And afterwards, the sort of way my family disowned me, you know, after it. And my friends disowned me. And it took a long time for anybody to start talking, talking to me again. You know, I was ostracized, really. Yeah, yeah the Americans. Once, once are, I was caught, like, yeah, you know. The Americans are good. I love the Americans as yeah. well. They're crazy, but they welcome people from all over the world. Oh, yeah. It's a great place. But it is. So when you're thinking about doing that, then, would you, did you never think about doing the casino you were in? No. Oh, no. No, no way. I was put in charge of casinos by a guy called Johnny Mack, second generation Americans. And because I was spent time in Long Cash, he was a big Republican supporter. He knew, trusted me without a thought. I would never, ever do a thing. I would never take a penny. And all the ones that worked in the casino, half of them were all ARA men from the hit blacks. And he knew he was well guarded, that nobody was going to steal a penny out of that place. And I worked my way right up the ladder. I became what was known as a box man. I took all the money from all the boxes inside the casinos, all of them, every night, filled them hundreds of thousands of dollars, taking away the safe place, and he knew there wouldn't be one dollar missing, and there never was. See, when you go there for the clean life, 
as part of you missed the old Sam though, living in the war zone, living in the madness because you were so used to it that you thought you wanted that extra buzz again? Yes. I, I, I didn't know what it was, you know, at the time, but you used to look back and think, and, oh, I've got a great casino, a lovely house and wife. And, but you're getting bored. You know, it's, not, it's a terrible thing to say, you're getting bored because you don't see a war going on, you know, it's nothing like that, you know, but there's just something missing in the back of your head. So when the, the brinks came up, I was like, oh God, this is great. This is like something being sent to me. You know, back again to see if I'm still got the balls that I used to have, you know, and that's what it all came down to, you know. I mean, I was testing myself, you know. <laughs> but when, when I went, I had this target in the back of my head, you know, 100, 200,000. I thought, you know, it'll do me, it'll be nice, you know. That's what I, my target was when I went into the brinks to rob it. Like, you know, I wasn't going to take anything else. How did you plan it? The plan went on for about two different, well, went on for basically for two years. The plan was so simple. Sometimes I say the best plans are the simple plans, you know, don't make it too complex, don't make it too difficult for yourself. But because I'd been up there so many times inside the fort, I seen the lack of security. There's one notorious thing that came out in a court. Sometimes they're at lazy, they refuse to lock the gates. They left a wee bit of wood or a pencil. So as a pizza man delivery used to come, so as he wouldn't have to do all the hassle of pressing bells and buttons and the guards that come down and let him in. They'd just have the pencil, push the pencil out of the road and go in through the doors and get in. And I couldn't believe all these things. I was taking note of all these stupid things that they were doing. You know, it's just American complacency. American, they were getting lazy. They were getting paid nothing. They're getting paid buttons. Yet here they are guarding hundreds of millions of dollars. Like you know, and the plan had come different times. And the way you're thinking, that's crazy. You're, you're going to get shot dead. You're going to bring shame to your family. After all you went through, you know, you're going to get caught. You're going to bring shame to your family. All this here, and then you're going to go to penitentiary if if you're lucky. And you don't get shot dead because these guards are going to shoot you dead for doing this craziness. These thoughts are going through your head. And then the wee devil comes on the other side and he said, No, you can do it. You know you can do it. You've done better things than this. You can do it, you know. But then the wee good person, Don't, don't be fucking listening to him. You're going down. You're going to jail. You know, you're going to be killed, you know. But that's how it started. How is that when you're planning that for two years? Like the, the good and evil's on your shoulders and yeah. everybody's shoulder when you've got your wife there, you're making money. But then you know what you put your dad through the last time? Yeah. And yet we still seem, uh -huh. like, you've done fucking mad stuff, but you, people who I interview, they still seem to choose that extra bit right. of something when their life is going good, this test, uh -huh. the powers of whoever controls this universe. Like, you're 100%, that, you're 100 course, right. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, 100%, because I kept saying, so why would you even think? You've got everything, <laughs> look at where you're living, you're living in a beautiful neighbourhood, you know? You've got a comic book store, the dream of your life, because I always dreamed about having a comic book store, you know, in New York. So it's got everything going for you. Got the casino, money, so much money, you can't spend it, you know. Your kids are going to great schools, your wife's hobby. Why would you fuck that up? But of course, I fucked it up, as usual, you know. It's just something in me. And there was a priest involved? Yeah, a priest, yeah, but he calls himself a priest, you know. I don't want, I'm not going to rip the bag out of him. Because he's not here to defend himself. Although he ripped the back out of me, magazines, newspapers all over America. You know, Did he, yeah? Oh, fuck Cheeky bastard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Typical, you know. And I always thought, I'm, I'm never going to go down as low as him, you know. I'm never going to fucking rip while he's not here to defend himself. But he was a bit of a rascal, like, you know. There was a lot of tragedy involved in the Brinks. And one of the biggest tragedies was there was a, a guy from Liverpool, an Irish guy. He was involved. He wanted to do the first robbery. But... We got up there and when we just, it was a winter, and just as we got approaching the fortress, he back, he turned up, he turned away, he chickened out, you know? And he always thought that he should have parts of a robbery, even though he wasn't going to take part in it, you know what I mean? I was, I don't like that sort of an attitude, like, you know, you're, you're chicken out, but you want everybody else to go and fucking put their life on the line, you know? So when he found out two years later that the pranks had been done, he just went one on one as two. He knew who it was. So he started coming around this priest who's a well known figure in the Irish American, looking after poor people down the village, you know. And he knew he and I, the priest, had had a friendship because I had to get all this furniture and all and give it to him so she'd give it to the poor and all this sort of stuff, you know. So Ronnie was watching and he knew Father Pat, as he calls himself, knew where I was. And he went to Father Pat one day, he says, Look, tell Sam I know what he did, but all I want is a hundred thousand. I keep my mouth quiet, you know. My father Pop was against me giving him money, you know. And I says, look, it's only 100,000. Look at the money we have. We had a room, half, see, half the size of this room was filled with dollars up the scene. Couldn't spend it, you know. We had $8 million sitting in this room. 
And he says, you're, you don't want to give them 100,000. It's only chicken feed. It's crumbs. So he says to me, okay, okay, okay. I'll give it to him. A week later, I met the priest. He says, yeah, it's okay. Take, taken care of. I'll give him it. You know, I didn't find out until the trial started that he didn't give it to him. And that's what started the whole shit. That's what caused us all to be caught. Fucked you over? You know, they found it underneath his bed, you know. And I says, and he wouldn't talk to me, see, during the trial, because he knew this was going to come out. We didn't know the FBI had videotapes off us. It was terrible, like, you know. So on the way to the job, how did you plan it out on, on the day of it? Well, I lived in New York, and it's up in Rochester. It's eight-hour drive, and it's quite, quite, uh, you're going up through the throughway. It's lovely, but it's during the winter. Quite treacherous. I mean, when snow falls in the market, it falls. It's not like the snow falls here. Like, maybe in Scotland, it's quite deep, you know, but over here, it's nothing. Like, a bit weary driving up there, but I met this guy who worked in the casino. He was one of our big guards, you know, and he'd done, he was an American Marine at the time, retired, got a lot of friggin' injuries and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, he's the guy to go with me, because Ronnie was supposed to do it with me. That's the guy from Liverpool. And I sort of way thought, that's an omen, not to do it. The fact that Ronnie chickened out, that was the first time. And I sort of believed it. I reconciled with myself, this wasn't supposed to be getting done. It was a saying, forget about it. But a year later, it starts going through my head and we got up there. And I knew it was, you had to go in the way I told him. I knew the cop would be on. I knew how to get in without anyone being hurt. That was a priority. No one could be hurt, even though we could be shot dead. I says, nobody should be hurt. Nobody should be killed. If we do it my way, swift for balls, you know, not thinking about it, we'll do it, we'll get in. And we did it. One of those coppers you were worried about because you knew he would shoot. There was an old guy in it. You know, he's one of these guys always watching these John Wayne movies and all, mm -hmm. twiddling his gun up near and all this bullshit. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like about, I want to get somebody coming in here and I shoot the balls off, yeah. you know? So I was warned about him. I said, see the R guards, they'll do the right thing. They'll just drop the, they don't give a shit. They're not there to save money. You know what I mean? I said, but that's the guy you got to watch. He's, a, he's the one that'll shoot anybody who comes. You know what I mean? So I was listening to all this and I thought, this is a guy that's going to shoot me. I thought, he, oh, I, I forget the name we had for him, you know, but he kept saying, I'm going to shoot the bastard in the balls first as his hand talking, you know, and then I shoot him in the head. You know, so he kept saying these things, you know. I thought, this bastard's going to blow my balls off, you know, mm -hmm. and he's going to shoot me in the head. But he was the one I was worried about. But he's about 70 years of age. You think it had more sense, you know? But I think he was just living his second life, you know, as a cowboy <laughs> or something, you know? <laughs> See, when you're driving towards it, what's the feeling you've got? Dread, excitement. This is it, you know, it's our show time or shit time, one or two. You know, you got a chance to turn back, but you, this guy's telling you, you can't turn back. You can't. But there's something saying, you fucking, what, you're crazy. Turn back, turn back. It's no shame. You haven't let anybody down, you know, except yourself. But this bastard in me is going, you're not turning back and you know you're not turning back. Yeah. Let's get up there. Get this <laughs> thing. Changed your life, everything going great, making dollar, and know. then you end up. It's absolutely fucking, stupid, you know, stupidity. Yeah, uh, but so when you're in there, how many guards were there? There was two, four, six where we were. And there was different guards over in the R section who couldn't hear what was going on. It's such a big, it's a massive place, you know. All the money from the west, from the east coast, sorry, would come there. So the night that we went in, there was over forty million. We went up in this little van, only tiny van, no bigger than that table. We stupid fan, because I say we were, we were only going to get like a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, be happy, you know what I mean? More, more, more than enough, you know. But we went in and we started packing all the money in the van, packed it right till you couldn't put a penny in, you know. Close it, we got in the van to get out the hell because you knew that the alarms were going to start going off shortly, you know. And we got in and the fucking car wouldn't start. All the black smoke is coming out from the engine, you know, because there's too much weight on it. So we're sweating like pigs because it took us so long to get the money in then we're getting out again. So we started pulling the money out and we don't know how much money we're taking out. And we don't know how much money we've left, but we finally got enough money in and to get out. The car's still going. So we get out and the gates, just as we get out, the gates are coming down because the alarms are starting to go off and the FBI and all has been alerted, you know. So we found out that we left about 20 odd million behind. We took with us just over around about 8 million, 7.5 million. So the... the the alarms went up straight away? The alarms went up within minutes of us leaving. And helicopters were in the air, cops everywhere, state troopers were out everywhere. Now we had to get back to New York, which is eight hours away, on the throughway, driving down, with all this money in the back. So you can imagine what we were thinking, and you're hearing the helicopters above you, just like Belfast, you hear the helicopters all the time, you know? And you're thinking, this is where we're going to go into this guard, the cops are waiting for us, the FBI shootout. 
And I thought they're going to hit the petrol tank and I'm going to go fucking in the flames and I'll go straight to hell now and all this shit's going to do my head like, you know. It was a long, long trip home back to New York. What did you tell your wife that night? Oh, she didn't know. She thought I was working in the casino as a manager, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just, and this is where it gets fucked up because I'm trying to assure her. No, no, she's not thinking anything. She doesn't know anything about it, like, you know. So I went and make a phone call. So I says, okay, babe, how's things? She says, okay, when are you coming home? I said, oh, I'm doing a double shift tonight. So I mean, get home about four o'clock in the morning, you know? She says, okay, take care now, get home safe and all. And be careful at subway, because I always took the subway into work, you know? I mean, she's always worried about somebody stabbing me in the subway, you know? Now, I see when I hung that phone up, little did I know that phone call came back to haunt me, because they were able to track it to my house that I called. It was a stupid thing to do. And did you not know that then? I never thought about that. It wasn't thing. The adrenaline yeah. stopped my brain thinking. Yeah, because then... I made so many stupid mistakes. You know, you look back and you think, yeah. fuck. Because right. then there's no cameras, there's yeah. no DNA. No, that. no, that's what I'm saying. If you're kind of in and out, you're driving away with the money, there's a good chance, a good percentage that you're, you're not going to get caught. Like. That's it. I mean, we got right into New York, got right into the house. I parked a car in a garage, open door garage, I imagine. All these people parked their cars, it's a, like a public garage, and left it and went to bed where all the money's sitting, you know? Anybody could have just went in and got that car, you know, and took it or looked in even, spotted and seen all the bags. What the hell's in there, you know, especially in New York, like, you know what I mean? Like, and you ended up getting surveillance from the FBI for six months. Oh, and you no. never knew, did you? No, never knew a thing. You no, know, you always watch. have that inkling. No. Usually you get a gut feeling. Like if I'm, if I'm not, I'm, don't do anything, but there's still an inkling that he's a copper. That's it. That's what, yeah. that's what I, it was one time, there was only one time during the whole nonsense, I was in, uh, down the village, I was coming out with all these big bags of money. We were moving it from one place to another, you know, I had these big duffel bags full of, it was hard to freaking lift. So I'm going into this place where we're, we're putting the money in this apartment and there's a black guy or, you know, and the next thing a black guy opens the door for me and that was the time, the back of my head said, they're fucking on to me because there's no way a black guy in New York is going to open the door for a white guy, you know? But he was actually opening the door so as he could follow me in the elevator to see what was on in the, he was in the FBI guy. He was in charge, he was the main FBI guy. This black guy was undercover. And he was there to try and get in the elevator with me. I stopped and I said, no, go you ahead, sir. Go you on first in front of me. So he was trying to get me to go out because he wanted to see what floor I was on. And he's missed no his flats. But I knew him. I mean, uh, something's wrong, you know. So when you think you're doing a job for 100, 200 grand, and then you start counting the money couldn't, out, couldn't and you realize you've nearly got $8 million. No, I, re I realized it fucked up. Why? So big, I knew it was in the shit. 200,000, you mean get away with you know, go on for a couple of months, people looking for you. But when you take that sort of money, it's, you're, you're going to get caught. Your fancy the FBI is going to go out for you. They'll, they'll find you, you know. And you had to teach, did you change the tires on your van or something? Yeah, like it was an hour fuck up. Because we got a tip from the cops. Like we, we had friends, lots of cops, friends, you know. And they says on the phone, a quick phone call, just says, get rid of tires. They're off to the tire print. You left the tire print behind because it was snowing. And we went in this big fort, it was all snowy. It was all nice and dry. So our prints go on just like liquors. I left the big print there. Of course, I didn't know it at the time, you know, they could take it like a fingerprint. The tire print was like a fingerprint, you know. And that was an hour reason that they caught me, you know. It's just, what are you thinking then, like after six months, like no, and that like you've no idea that the coppers are following you and you think you're away scot-free with the money were you spending it though though were you buying no, I cars wasn't, jewelry like? no this is a part terrible thing about it this is a terrible thing about the whole fucking thing i never i wanted rid of it i was getting migraine headaches because the smell the smell is paper money it was horrendous you would really need a gas mask to go in it was, it's hard to explain this fucking fumes that were coming off as old money you know and i was getting sick of it and i was just trying to get rid of it i was giving out money left right and center to all the, the homeless, the hobos down in the Hell's Kitchen, Vietnam vets. I'm not trying to sound like Robin Hood here. Robin Hood, yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to do it to get rid of a lot of it, you know. You couldn't, and the more you got rid of it, that seemed to grow. You couldn't get <laughs> fucking rid of it, you know what I mean, mate? <laughs> and I just, that's when I contacted Pat. I said, Pat, I've got some money. You, you know people, maybe you can head it for me. So he's thinking I must have 20,000. I'm an illegal alien working in a casino. You know, put some money away from me. And then when he's seen it, he threw away like was shocked. But he didn't turn his back. So he says a thing. He says, yeah, okay. You know? And then he was doing all sorts of wee dodgy stuff. 
behind my back, you know. But that's uh, he's not here to defend himself and not willing to talk about. <laughs> you know, if you want to know about it, just read Donna Brinks, my mm -hmm. memoir, where the yeah. whole book's in, you know. We'll leave the link to your book. Um, yeah, very good. So when you get, how did you get caught? Well, there's a, Queens where I was living, eventually. There's a big post office. I used to go in there and get all the money changed in the post office money orders, you know. And I'd had a shop going, a couple of shops going, so I was using them to clean this sort of thing. So very amateur. I wasn't really thinking. I was getting complacent because I thought I got away with it, you know. But I remember this uh, Monday morning, I forget, I went down. Just as I went into the post office, the place was buzzing. There was fruit stalls everywhere owned by the Koreans and all, you know, bakers. It's always buzzing. Jackson Heights never stops. So I never thought of anything off. I went in, got myself, got the change, got the money changed and came out. The minute I opened the door, you couldn't hear a pin drop. All the fruit stores and all are locked up and there wasn't a sinner in the streets. This is a street for thousands of people. And all of a sudden there's not a sinner. And do you think you go, hmm, something strange here. And I was like a zombie movie all of a sudden. What the fuck happened here, you know? And I knew there, I was caught, I was finished. So I just went up the street. My van was parked two streets away. And I just knew it was only a matter of seconds before I'm going to be arrested, you know? And I went up. The minute I put my hand on the door handle off the van, they came from everywhere, the FBI. You know, started screaming. So, where's your guns? Where's your guns? I never had a gun. Never had a gun. You know, but they obviously thought I'd walk around. You know, I'm going to shoot it out. These guys don't know all this shits in their heads. You know, their, you know, and that what, was it. What are you thinking then? Like, what, what? When did it come to the realization that you'd fucked up again? Like? There, at that second, my life's finished. Who pops into your mind? Your mum, your, your wife, or your dad? My wife, kids. Never thought of anybody else. Wife and kids. I said, I fucked this up, and this is the biggest fuck up I, I've ever done in my life. I'm never, I'm never going to get out of it. Potential life sentence? Oh, yeah. No, I'm never going to get out. I'm, dead. I'm going to die in penitentiary. I had it already. It all came flouching at me. You know I mean? I knew exactly what was waiting for me. That sort of money. <sighs> no way. Especially tying up people. and Tying up people, you know, you charge yeah. for kidnapping them and all this here sort of mm -hmm. stuff, you know? So when you get took to the cop shop, like, was that straightforward or was it still trying to well, the charge thing straight is, away? See, here's the thing. The FBI never dealt with anybody like me. Because I already know interrogations. I mean, I went through interrogations where you get tortured, yeah. you know? So these guys, for, first thing insult me is by the Senate and all these Irish American FBI guys. And they come in, they start the bullshit, talk about, oh, they love a good Irish beard. Did you ever meet the, and start talking about Blarney, Leprechaun bullshit, you know, it's insulting. But I just sit there and I refuse to talk to them. And I get angry because I've never understood, I've never met anybody in America who never talked to them. They always talk. Every, all Americans talk. They all get themselves away. They'll stop, start talking, you know. But I would, I refused to talk to them for three days up in Police Plaza 1 where they were holding me, you know. And they said, you're going to penitentiary. Your wife's been arrested. You know, they hit them all this shit. Your kids are going to go to an orphanage. So you're still sitting there trying to be calm, but you know you're not. You're fucking inside. You're dying because you're thinking, fuck, that could be true what they're saying. But you're not. We're giving you this one and only chance to get down first. That's what's called in America if you want to be a tout being a former, get down first, that's what it's called. They come to you and let you come, go first, to squeal on your friends. So the kids start going, they've got the priest, my heart's beating fucking, you know, and say like, you know, and I'm still trying to keep my face straight, you know, and we got your friend, the cop O'Connor, my face must have dropped in, because I'm thinking, fuck, con has got on to do it, but they've brought him in, there, obviously because of my connection, and we've got this, our guy, Charlie McCauley, I call him, I never heard of Charlie calling him in life. It says, yeah, we know him. He's, he's an arm master, man. I never knew who the hell Charlie McCauley was. Found out later, he's a guy that owned the apartment. He's away in Hawaii. Father Pat behind his back uses his apartment without telling him to put all the money in. So to have him, to bring him in, a teacher never been in trouble in his life, never had a parking ticket, you know? Now, all of a sudden, he's a big bank robber. Poor guy, like, he's never in trouble in his life. Fucking shattered. I didn't know how, who he was or what he was. It wasn't until during the trial I started to find out who this guy was. He owned the apartment. He was a good friend of Father Pat's. Father Pat knew he was in Hawaii. So he says, could I borrow your apartment for a couple of weeks? Didn't say like, I've got eight million stolen dollars here. You know, he just says, could I borrow it? He always thought, well, Father Pat looks after immigrants. He's probably going to put a couple of illegal aliens in there. That's probably what was going through Charlie's head at the time. Felt, felt terrible for Charlie. Shattered, out of his world. He wasn't in that sort of a world, you know? And you can just see, it's terrible. His family, his mother and father, and all was there, and with the court hearings. That was, that was a terrible time. How long did it take for you to get charged? Two years, because what they were doing with me, the priest, the teacher, and the cop was so funny. Like all the New York Times had it, it was uh, the priest, the teacher, the decorated cop, 
an ARA revolution. Like a joke in it. You know, and you're thinking, <laughs> what the fuck is that, you know? <laughs> so, and they all got bail. It's the only in America. I mean, you would never get bail in New York, you know? Mm -hmm. But the only reason I didn't get bail, because I was an illegal alien. I refused to become American, you see, you know, because I didn't want to give up my Irish citizenship. So they couldn't let me because I was classified as an illegal alien. So they started doing this thing called me, uh, you know, diesel therapy. What it is, they put you in these trucks, pickup trucks, where we prison or we cell made up inside the, the truck, two guards at the front, and start traveling through the mountains. This is during the winter now, you know. So I'm only, I've only got a wee uh, jumpsuit on. I'm handcuffed all over the place, you know. I start taking us through all the mountains, you know, tearing you out. You're not getting any food. You're exhausted, you know. And the smell of fumes from the engine, the diesel, starting to give you terrible migraine headaches, you know. So it's called diesel therapy. The FBI use it to break people down. They want to think I've got a potential person who's going to turn and turn state seven. So I thought that, but after about three months, they knew they weren't going to get anything from me. They couldn't believe it. After the trial, my lawyer says, see all the MFBI guys, you all want to come and shake your hands because of what you endured and you didn't give one person up. He says, I've never seen anything like it in their life. Was that easier for you compared to what you've went through anyway? Uh, oh yeah, it was a lot easier than the hits blocks. You know, it was nothing. It was just like a fucking ride. Like, it was nasty. Like, don't get me wrong. It was, it was nasty. Like, having to go through mountains and on, going to prison. And when you get into prison, you get in there at 3 o'clock in the morning, you go through all the search and procedure, which is about three hours, you know, and all this shit. You get into the cell. You don't know who you're getting put in the cell with, you know. Fuck, you know. And next thing you make a bed, you're just getting into it, you're beat. Next thing, come on. And you get moved again to our prison, you know, 20, 20 hours away. So we're doing this for two years to break you down, you know. Is that like a ghost run? It's terrible. And, but when you went to court, like, there was a massive fuck up because you, it was against your human rights to be getting yeah, travelled so, so a, far. Yeah, this is the only in America, you know. So my, my, we had these lawyers. One of them was David Bowie's lawyer, you know. And, uh, they came to that night, we were, we were all having a big meeting. I mean, this is all the guys who'd done the robbery having a meeting inside the courthouse with all the lawyers. It's so funny, like, you know. So one of them's going, listen, we're going to put this proposal to the judge tomorrow. I'm not listening because I don't believe it. I know I'm going for life. You know what I mean? I'm going to, so I'm not listening anymore. I don't want to listen anymore. I'm feeling all wrapped up in self-pity. I'm not listening to all this bullshit, you know. They're saying, we're going to put this proposal to the judge at your human rights. You know, we're broke. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? She says, they shouldn't have moved you from New York. They sh that's where, the, where you lived. But they brought you all the way up to Rochester because it's a hillbilly town full of cops and they know the jury will convict you in, in a heartbeat, you know? So I didn't believe it. I went back to my cell in the county jail, you know? The next thing this guy says, you know, you've got one of the best lawyers in New York, Tony Morali and all this. You know? I said, yeah, 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 whatever. So I went over to the court the next day and the judge dropped all the major charges because my human rights have been violated. I mean, fuck, only in America. <laughs> only in America. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't believe it. And then I found out I could only get five years. It was like I won the lotto. I just went, oh, fuck, can't believe it. I can only get five years, you know?